All right, let me get queued up. All right, Daphne, whenever you're ready. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the February 2022 meeting of the Garrett County NAACP. I am so glad that we have people here. We have a fantastic program tonight, and uh, I hope all of you will listen and learn. Let every voice sang, sing till earth and heaven ring. Oh, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Yeah, you're good. All right. Well, thank you all for attending again our wonderful presentation. We are all excited to be here and be able to share in these stories that will be coming up. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, we formed the Garrett County NAACP branch less than a year ago. And given the demographics and history of our rural mountain area, many people thought it would be impossible. Now we represent the last county in Maryland to form an NAACP chapter. So we strive to shine a light on our region's remarkable history of struggles for racial equality and human rights. These stories are so important, yet most times they're forgotten. So as a group, we decided to make this event accessible to everyone via free tickets. Donations are greatly appreciated. Mm -hmm as the vital work we do depend on the generosity of our supporters like you. So we ask that each of you click on the two links provided in the chat to contribute as, as you are able to, if you're able to help us cover the cost of this event. So the link for our Garrett County NAACP is www.gcnaacp.org. And then for our guests, our very special guest, www.rrwilkinson.org. And like I said, they're both provided here in the link. 
So go ahead, help us support this lovely event and let's take it away. It's gonna be a great night. Beautiful. Right. Thank you, Shauna. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us for our first Black History program. Uh, we're so honored to share this special event with you. And now for the introduction of our tonight's of tonight's speakers. Uh, Nadine Wilkinson Johnson, born in Richmond and raised in Roanoke, Virginia, experienced racism and injustice at the young age. In 1960, at the age of seven, Nadine and her sister, Cassandra Wilkinson Lighty, integrated Melrose Elementary School in Roanoke, Virginia. As a child, this experience was truly eye-opening. In 1964, Nadine moved to Portsmouth, Virginia with her mother. At the age of 14, Nadine experienced another integration as she trans transitioned to high school. In her junior year, Nadine transferred to IC Norcombe High School due to, to the change of school bus uh, zone laws. Nadine was excited to attend the school, same school as her sister, Cassandra, and be amongst her friends. In 1971, after Nadine graduated high school, she moved to Laurel, Maryland to begin her career in healthcare. Nadine married in 1983 and had two children, Nathaniel and Marcella Benjamin. For several years, Nadine continued her work in healthcare as a health aide in PG County Public Schools. She then began working in group homes, which housed and provided care to mentally challenged residents. In addition, Nadine assisted and supported David Harrington, former mayor of Bladingsburg, with his campaign. Nadine attends Buffalo Baptist Church in Mount Rainier, Maryland, where the Bishop John B. McIntyre is pastor. Nadine enjoys singing and community outreach. In her spare time, Nadine loves dancing and cooking while spending time with her grandchildren, Angel and Christian. Currently, Nadine has a passion to help children within the community by voicing the importance of gun laws and advocating against the creation and sale of toy guns to young children. Nathaniel Raymond Benjamin is the son of Nadine Wilkinson Johnson and the grandson of civil rights leader, Reverend Raymond R. Wilkinson, who was president of the NAACP in Roanoke, Virginia in the 1960s. Nathaniel Benjamin was born in Washington, DC and raised in Maryland. He attended Northwestern High School. In 2005, Nathaniel went to Woodstock Educational Center in Woodstock, Maryland, and earned his certificate in data entry. On February 27, 2020, he wrote an article that was published in the Roanoke Times for Black History Month about the civil rights achievements of his grandfather, Reverend R.R. Wilkinson. Last year, he created and launched his grandfather's website, highlighting the historical events of, of his grandfather's leadership with integrating Roanoke, Virginia. Make sure to add your questions in the chat box for the following Q&A. And without any further ado, please welcome Nadine Wilkinson Johnson and Nath Nathaniel Raymond Benjamin. All right, take it away, Nadine. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Black History program. I am Nadine Wilkinson Johnson. I am the middle daughter of Reverend Wilkinson. He was the president of the NAACP <laughs> in Roanoke, Virginia from 1959 to 1968. As some of you could see that you saw some photos of my sister and I walking to integrate Melrose Elementary School in Roanoke, Virginia. I was seven years old and my sister Cassandra Wilkinson Light, she was eight years old. During this time, we attended a lot of mass meetings with my father, Reverend Wilkinson. And some of the churches that we had the mass meeting in was First Baptist Church and Hill Street Baptist Church. 
And that was at the old church uh, on McDowell Avenue. The purpose of the mass meetings, they were held at night. And we had a lot of black ministers to show up. We had white ministers show up. And they would have a lot of conversations and meetings about what they're going to do the next day. There were marches going on, demonstrations, and uh, a lot of things that were happening was the Royal Oak Memorial Hospital. They didn't allow colored people to enter their hospitals. We couldn't get admitted. So they demonstrated about that. So about integration, my sister and I, this was in 1960, we integrated uh, Melrose Elementary School. And a lot of people asked me, were you afraid? No, I wasn't afraid because our father, Reverend Wilkinson, would always, that week he would go over some things with us. And also I wasn't afraid because on the first day of school, our mother, Euphysenia Wilkinson Massey, she held our hands and we walked toward the front of the school. So we had our mother with us, so I wasn't that afraid. But when we got to the front of the school, there was the principal, he was standing at the door and he received us, welcomed us into the school. I also was asked, how did the teachers treat us? How did our classmates treat us? So in my classroom, there were two of us, two colored students. And my teacher, she, she was fairly nice. And also, I, I, I know that a lot of teachers knew who our father was. Reverend Wilson would always come up to the school to check on us. And I was asked, how did this, the, my classmates treat me? where a lot of them uh, would stare at me. They would uh, look at the color of my skin. Some of them would touch my skin. And, uh, and I know that was just out of ignorance because of the way some of their parents probably raised them. Okay, I'm gonna move on now to immigration. Reverend Wilkinson and the biracial committee, they didn't stop there with integrating the public schools. Okay. The next place was they, they worked on integrating was the Royal Oak Memorial Hospital. And after that was the restaurants. At the restaurants, you had a lot of, a few ministers that went with, that went with Reverend Wilson up to the restaurant. And you had also the young activists. They, their job was to go into the restaurants to see if they could have any problems because the Civil, Civil Act, the Civil Rights Act was out. And a lot of places were supposed to be integrated. So they had no problems going there to the restaurant. 
So after that, my father, Reverend Wilkinson, he decided to take his family there to the same restaurant. And at that time, all of my sisters were there and my mother. So my other sister, Danita Wilkinson, was there and Cassandra and I. And when we got there, we got, we got waited on. And we were sitting there for a very long time. And my father sat there and he said, he called on the uh, waiter. He said, uh, uh, we've been sitting here for a while. What, what's it taking so long? And uh, he said to her, do you know who I am? And she must have went and asked her manager because when she came back, we got waited on very fast. So moving on to the uh, movie theater. Because our father, what he did, he would, uh, I believe he would use my sister and I to check, check on these places to make sure they they, they were integrated and they weren't giving uh, colored people any problems. So my father drove us to the white movie theater. And uh, he sat in the car while Cassandra and I went on up there to get our tickets. And uh, we got in with no problems, y'all. And um, the movie that was playing that year was Flipper. So the next place that our father, Reverend Wilson, tried <laughs> was Lakeside Amusement Park. Now, the park was supposed to be integrated so that the colored people could, children could attend. But the pools were still segregated. So we were standing in line with our father this time and uh, to get our tickets. And I, uh, while we were standing in line, we got a lot of stares from the white uh, parents. We got a lot of stares like from the, uh, the children, like, what are y'all doing here? And, um, so when we got to the ticket box, you know, we got in, no problem. So the next thing was going on. Uh, we we got place, they got places integrated. So now it's time for black people to have jobs. So the first jobs that were offered to the black teachers, they had the opportunity to go to the white schools to teach. The other places that got integrated was the police department. After that, it was the fire department. So, I'm finished with my speech, and I would like to introduce you all to my son, Nathaniel Raymond Benjamin. All right, Mama. he will he he will be speaking to you all about the struggles of the integration that Reverend Wilkinson and the biracial committee. Four, four. Thank you. Thank you, Mama. Um, first, I would like to thank the Garrett County NAACP um, chapter for having us um, this evening. Um, uh, it's, this is a real special night and a special occasion. And uh, we're just glad to be here. Uh, I'm going to begin with a little background 
um, about my grandfather um, as he jump-started the uh, integration in Roanoke, Virginia. And keep in mind that um, this all started in 1960. And the Civil Rights Act was not signed until four years later. So 1960, my grandfather was doing a lot of things early, earlier than most um, other cities, um, to you know, further further south, and they had um, greater greater problems down there. But um, in Roanoke, Virginia, it was a little bit more. Um, they didn't have a lot. They didn't want a lot of attention. A lot of publicity negative press. They didn't enjoy a lot of negative press. And so uh, my grandfather was aware of this. So that's when he began to take advantage of, uh, of all the people that were afraid uh, of bad publicity, wanted to, wanted to have a good name to their town, despite the racism that was going on. Um, rather, they chose to ignore the problem of racism instead of acknowledging that we have work to do with the Black community. But of course, this was during the Jim Crow South. Um, throughout history, there are pivotal moments in the world that captivates the spirit of individuals to stand up for what's right. In the face of opposition, when they do, once they decide enough is enough, once they make their minds to act, such individuals can spark revolutions and birth a movement. But with great resistance comes heavy opposition against the change they seek. It is during such turbulent times when a leader rises up from the midst of opposition to lead his people to Freedomsville. That leader was my grandfather, Reverend Raymond R. Wilkinson, who was, of course, president of the NAACP in Ronald, Virginia. I use that word freedoms bill because my grandfather used that term frequently. And if you look at some of the old newspapers on um, Reverend R. R. Wilkinson's website, you will see the word mm -hmm. freedoms bill. And so this is his favorite term. He will lead his people to Freedomsville. So the civil rights, be, the civil rights in Ronald actually began um, in March of 1960. And when, that's when a group of um, students, and most of them, of course, they were all black, they decided to integrate Woolworths. They took it upon themselves that they wanted to change and they act. And um, they acted accordingly. They, they just decided, let's get together and go to this lunch counter and see if we will be served. Okay. And so they went into the lunch counters. Um, they went into Woolworths, set, they sat down at the lunch counters um, and they waited to be served. But of course, all of the employers, most of them were white. They turned their backs on them. They ignored them. They pretended like they weren't there. And basically they were treated like, you know, less than nothing. And so they waited there to be served for several hours. And it's not written how many um, hours they spent there, but um, I was I was in my research. I was 
I seen that it was several hours. So uh, with no service at all. So this sparked the interest of my grandfather in, in, in the NAACP to act on their behalf and on um, all the citizens' behalf, the black citizens' behalf um, in, in Ronald, you know. Uh, and this was 1960 at a time where sit-ins were, were just starting to become popular. But Ronald, government tend to ignore the situation and act like everything was okay. They, and that's it. And they had a sense of, um, well, everything is okay. We live in a happy town and, you know, we, we get along with everybody. Ignoring that there was discrimination and racism going on in that city. So my grandfather was very outspoken and he did not hold his tongue. He let them know four days after the students tried to integrate Woolworths, he let them know in the press that demonstrations were coming to Ronald. And that stirred up Ronald government. And he liked to, to stir things up. As they say, he, my grandfather liked to rock the boat. He was a boat rocker. And so that immediately got the NAACP. Um, they become they, they got I guess they became um, a target for um, certain certain people in Roanoke, you know, um, to just denounce and give them bad rep, you know. Um, and it was and all, and it's also a time when uh, my grandfather, um, he purposely put that in the newspapers um, that the sentence were coming because just to let them know that a change were coming to Ronald and we were not gonna take discrimination anymore or racism. So my grandfather went to uh, the, I guess the capital of, um, or the city hall of Ronald, Virginia. And of course, at that time, um, most, of the, most of the people there that ran the local government, they were, all, they were all white. And you had a few faces of color people working there. Um, so my grandfather had meetings with the mayor and the city manager on how to deal with this race issue. But of course, once again, my grandfather, my grandfather and uh, the NAACP, they face a lot of heavy um, opposition. You know, um, they told him that everything was fine and um, the laws were okay. The Jim Crow laws are the law of the land in the South, and there's nothing you can do to change them, you know? Um, and this was unacceptable to my grandfather, of course. You know, he was not gonna take no for an answer. So, of course, he was frustrated with the Ronald government for not cooperating with him. So he um, gave a press conference in about, um, April 14th, 1960. Um, and I believe this video is on um, the rrwilkinson.org website. And his press conference, he basically um, called out Ronald government for not helping the NAACP with race relations in that county um, and we're in, we're in the city. And um, so that's how it started that um, he got them, he, he called them out on ignoring the racism that was there. So, of course, uh, what happened next 
my grandfather just took matters into his own hands since he couldn't get cooperation with the government. You know, um, and I think that they were pretty scared. Um, to tell you the truth, the people that did want to work with him, there was a few whites that wanted to work with him, but they were a little afraid because they answered to the governor of Virginia. And he was a strong segregationist at that time. So um, it's, it was just, it was, um, that's, the way the, that's how things were. So my grandfather took matters into his own hands. He started a biracial committee. He reached out to white businessmen, several white businessmen around the city. And he reached out to black businessmen. He got them together. It was 12 of them, six whites, six blacks. They all came together, working together um, for a common good, for a solution to the race problem. But most importantly, they worked together to integrate um, establishments in Roanoke. And so uh, that's how it happened. And there was um, a lot of things going on at the time that were very dangerous. Um, and in fact, it really was a dangerous time to form certain committees because technically, since this was 1960, technically they was breaking the law when they formed that committee, the biracial committee. They was taking, they was they was taking the law into their own hands, as they saw it, you know, as other people saw it. But, but to them, they was changing the status quo. So they had to be secret a secret committee since they were technically breaking the law. Uh, my grandfather would call them um, equality, uh, outlaws for equality. And so what my grandfather did was he formed a committee in secret. Sometimes he would have um, meetings about planning how to integrate in the, their places of business. Um, one person was a doctor. He would have meetings in their doctor's office, planning out strategies. Sometimes he would take my mother and my aunt Cassandra as little girls. He would take them with him to the doctor's office to make it seem like they were just going to the doctor, you know, getting a checkup. But in reality, he had them wait out in the waiting room and while my grandfather and the doctor who was part of the biracial committee mapped out plans to form sit-ins and integrate. So my grandfather was always five, 10 steps ahead and very you know, cautious when it came to strategizing. You know, and, um, but then he began to also hold meetings at his house at night. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, when his biggest, his biggest, um, his the biggest thing he did that really changed the way um, that sit-ins would go was that my grandfather also he would, of course, bring the white business owners and the managers. Um, of Woolworth and invited them to his house and they would discuss plans in his basement. Um, and, you know, negotiating with him and they would map out how things were going to go because Ronald newspapers was trying to scare everybody. They were saying that, oh, it's going to be a riot. Oh, this is not going to be good. Um, they're trying to, an NMACP trying to integrate um, Woolworths. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Everybody going to be scared. Going to have a riot on their hands. You know, they was panicking. It was panicking. But my grandfather knew better. Behind the scenes, he was negotiating. He and as my grandmother said, he brung 
the white managers into the fold and let them see that change was not nothing to fear. So all of them was part of the change. And then, so then the next day, when integration started, August 27, 1960, that is when Woolworth became um, integrated for the first time in Ronald. They, everything went smoothly. And the, the newspapers, the media were shocked at how everything would go smoothly. My grandfather watched from afar as um, a mother and a child, a black woman and a child, had Sundays and a pie. Um, the manager let them sit at the counter and it all went smoothly. And that was that. So that is how, that was the start. So once Woolworth were integrated, that jump-started the movement in Ronald and everybody started um, getting involved, especially the young people. The young people of Ronald, um, most of them was in high school, they started their own group called the Student Ronald Student Committee or the Ronald Student Movement. And they started their own um, committee to help you know, go to sit-ins and, and restaurants, drink from water fountains. My grandfather would get young preachers to go and drink out of water fountains or stay at the hotel. So everything was forming together. Everything was coming together all at once. And this was in 1960. So by next year, 1961, a lot of people would come through to test out integration to see if there would be any problems. One of the group of people that came to Toronto in 1961, a year later, to test out segregation was, um, or integration, was the Freedom Riders. The Freedom Riders came to Roanoke and they stayed at the Holiday Inn in 1961. And when they thought they were gonna get static, they thought, you know, they were gonna have problems. And there was no problems at all. They was accepted. It was all accepted in. They stayed at the hotel without any problems. Do you know why? Because my grandfather had integrated it the year before. So, so Ronald was known, you know, my grandfather and the NAACP, they was known for just, you know, doing things early, very early, and just um, integrating things earlier than most cities in the South. And that was, um, that was the way it happened. And, and, didn't, and then you started to see a domino effect, a domino effect at the end, you know, um, the hospital started integrating one after another, um, the cafeteria, First cafeteria in Ronald started integrating in 63. Um, Victory, Victory Stadium was integrated in 1961 um, when my, uh, my grandfather took advantage of a situation there in 1961 with Victory Stadium. Um, Victory Stadium was where all the football games were held. And then in 1961, um, the football game was hosting, the NFL was hosting a, a scrimmage game between the Baltimore Colts at the time and the Pittsburgh Ravens. Now, of course, the stadium was integrated, was not integrated yet. It was still segregated. So my grandfather telegrammed the black players from each team, Pittsburgh Steelers and Baltimore Colts. He sent them a telegram asking them to protest the game unless they integrate the stadium. And guess what happened? They were getting ready to do it. They were doing so. They said, okay, we're not going to play then unless it's integrated. The stadium is integrated. Well, this is stirred up the NFL, of course. And of course, you know, what's going on today is kind of parallel to what's happening today, today in the NFL. So this has been a long, long problem. But in 1961, of course, it was a little worse. So um, this stirred up the NFL and they didn't like it. So they had a meeting with my grandfather in a secret room the night before the game, that's the business game where to start. And they worked out a negotiation deal, uh, you know, a negotiation. They said, well, the stadium would not, they agreed that the stadium would not per se be segregated, well, integrated. Um, the stadium would not be integrated in name to the public. 
but you're welcome to buy the tickets, but blacks can still buy tickets to go in and sit down. So that's exactly what my grandfather did. And um, the next day they held a game and uh, the black players agreed to play. Once they heard that my grandfather had negotiated with the NFL the commissioner, um, the NFL commissioner. So they played that, they played in a playing the scrimmage game and my grandfather bought tickets to the NAACP with his, you know, he bought tickets for his NAACP members. Um, he brought them along. They sat, they sat in their seats in the white section. They sat in their seats. Nothing, <laughs> nothing happened. Nothing happened. But the media was very, very afraid that uh, once again that something will happen. So they called the fire department. They called the police department. They even called the FBI. Some of the FBI agents were there and <laughs> reported being there. And oh my goodness, they just came to watch the football game because nothing else happened. And that's how Victory Victory Stadium was integrated, and they and and, 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 it, and did it in a smooth way. So uh, it just all came together. And after the stadium, year by year, um, throughout the '60s, then the movie theaters were integrated, the fire department. Um, the biracial committee, my grandfather and the biracial committee, they always used their, the same strategy, which is to get people who were opposing segregation, get them to join in and negotiate with them and to do it gradually. Once they was done gradually, then slowly it was, it was integrated, you know, and um, soon you had the first two Blacks integrate the fire department. And that was done behind the scenes with the biracial committee um, and my grandfather who negotiated with the fire chief on a timetable to bring, to, 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 to hire two black firemen, the first two in Rono. This was 1963. So, that's how fire department got integrated and slowly the police department. Um, the police department, um, surprisingly doing my research, I found out that the police department um, were kind of, were, were half integrated, not quite fully. Um, they started, they did hire blacks in the fifties during that time in Ronald, but they did not, but it was only like two or three, three black people on the force. And so um, my grandfather, of course, saw this as a problem and, was, and, and told the um, police chiefs, like, you're going to have to start hiring um, more black people and, we, and you ain't got to promote them too. Um, because even though there was police department, there were black people in the police department, the black police department, they'll only send them to the black neighborhoods to walk, you know, back in, I guess they called walking the beat. They will only walk um, the beat to black neighborhoods, not white. They were not allowed to walk the beat in white neighborhoods. So my grandfather, of course, trying to change this. And uh, the last thing I'm gonna talk about real shortly is um, the, another major event that happened in Ronald that uh, my grandfather had a, a huge part in was leading the um, the protests to getting Washington Park dumped out of the black neighborhood. Um, for years, Ronald just dumped all the dump, the, the, the main dump, what they call Washington Park dump, was in the black neighborhood in Washington Park, in the Gainesboro neighborhood. And so there was just, you see, and you will see it on the um, www.rrwilkinson.org, um, you, you will see pictures of the dump and they're just dumping trash and waste in the neighborhood. Sometimes fires would start. Children would play near the dump. Um, the, the dump was also near the school and, if, and it had rats going into the pool. Also, um, when the rats was in the pool, the black, the black people, um, black people, black residents in the neighborhood was trying to 
call the police, trying to tell them these, we gotta get rid of this dump because rats in, in, are in the pool where our children play in. The children were getting sick, they were getting respiratory problems. I talked to some of the people that survived that lived in that neighborhood during those times as children. They said they have asthma now and lung problems because of the effects of the dump being in their neighborhood. And, and um, today, if this would have had happened today, it would have been a tremendous, large amount of a big lawsuit. So, but back then, they they didn't care. Um, they just say, well, we we'll just you know use the black neighborhood as a main dump. And there you go. So, they, so, um, so my, of course, this was a very, very big controversial um, subject in um, Toronto at that time, in 1963. So, my grandfather. Um, Got to met, got you know formed formed the biracial committee again. They all came together again to talk to the mayor and the city manager to work out plans to get rid of the dump by June the first, nineteen sixty three. Okay, well he ran into my grandfather ran into more opposition when somebody with from within tried to sabotage this deal, and this was the city city manager, the city manager had more influence over the city council than the mayor did. The mayor was, was, was on my grandfather's side. But the city council, the city, the city council, his name was City Council Owens, he thought of reasons why it should not be done. He thought of reasons to start a date. He wanted the date pushed to a year. And was like, we don't have no new location for the for the dump. We don't, we don't have nowhere to put the new dump. Um, we, we, it takes time. It takes pe- patience. My grandfather was like, well, I mean, how long do you want to wait? You got children getting sick, playing in the dump, and you want to wait another year to get rid of the dump. That's not going to happen. No, sir, that, that's not going to happen. So, of course, my grandfather did not stand for that. So he, um, once again, behind the scenes, because this is how he works, behind the scenes, and the strategy, uh, he held rallies at his Hillsby Baptist Church. He held rallies and plans on how to um, influence the city council to get rid of that dump. And um, he also managed to get allies. And once they kept saying, "Oh, we can't, we know, we, we we can't get rid of the dump right now. Um, we can't do that. We can't get rid of the dump because we have we don't have a new incinerator. We don't have a." We don't have a new location. Well, my grandfather was like, well, these, those are just excuses for you not to, to, you know, move that dump out of the black neighborhood. And he saw that. And I, I think many people saw that. And um, so uh, at one point, of course, the city, um, the mayor was uh, really upset with this, the city, um, the, the city manager, because he knew that the city manager was kind of pointing the strings. Um, and, and just setting up roadblocks, you know, and uh, this was very political. This was very political, and so um, so even the, the mayor threatened to fire him. You know, he said, "I'll get a new city manager if we don't cooperate and get this dump out of here by June the first in sixty sixty three. And but he was not phased. He wasn't phased by it. He was not phased at all. He was like. I have a lot of influence in this town, and I, I am not going to lose my job, even if you are the mayor. So um, while they were infighting in the Toronto government, then that's when my um, grandfather worked behind the scenes to get allies. He got um, Presbyterian pastors, um, um, white, white clergymen on his side to back him. and. Um, you see in the videos, he stood up to the city council and had a platoon of supporters behind him, both black and white. And he stood up to the city council on May 13, 1963, and told him to get that dub out of there. And he th- even threatened him. He threatened the city council that if you do not move that city dump out of Ron- of, of Washington Park, out of the black community by June the 1st, 
I'm going to go down to Washington Park with mothers and their babies. And I'm going to call this the, the, the mother barricade. The, mom, the mothers and baby carriers barricades. So he would go, he said he was going to bring mothers with their babies and carriages and march all of them down to Washington Park dump to form a human chain to barricade the dump truck from coming in. That's what he told him. He told the city council this. Once he said this, that created another stir in the city council, and they were shook. They were shook to death because they could not bear the thought of having the bad publicity to that city and everybody coming in and having that much attention. So my grandfather knew this. And so um, he had a very keen sense of that. Of um, So once he made his threats, long story short, I'm going to close this, um, on, the, on I say about uh, May 31st, yes, May 31st, 1963, they, the city council voted to move that dump out of the black neighborhood by June the 1st. And that's how he got that done. He won that victory. So um, this, my grandfather was uh, known for a lot of things and, that, and, and for a lot of changes being made in that town. And um, today people, um, they are benefiting from those changes. And um, if you go to Ronald Virginia today, to, to, today, there's a, the park is a, is a brand, a whole new park, you know, and um, and there's no dump there, most importantly. So uh, I'm very proud of my grandfather and the work he did as uh, NAACP president. And um, he even did things beyond, um, even when after he stepped down in 1968, he still changed, um, made changes and was outspoken. He, he, he was never... He never stopped being outspoken. He was still outspoken doing certain things um, and uh, problems around the city when it comes to um, the black community. So um, I'm very proud of him. And, um, and I will continue to spread his legacy um, to future generations. So this will never happen again. So I thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Applause, everybody. We can't hear you, but put them up. Put them up. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Nadine. Thank you, Nate. I'm so much love, so I'm much courage coming from you guys. <laughs> feel it. I feel it right now. Thank you so much. Um, we're gonna we're gonna launch into Q and A real fast. So I'm gonna ask Nadine the first question. Nadine, when you're ready. Um, okay. So the first question is. You were so young when you integrated schools in Roanoke. How did it affect you and your sister Cassandra growing up? How did it affect us? Well, when we started school, first grade, second grade, we attended Loudoun Elementary School. So that was all black elementary school. So it affected us because we missed our friends. And we are like, we want to stay here at this school. But uh, other than that, like I said, the way our father was, we had no problems. Everything went peacefully that first day. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, so next question is from Whitney. Uh, can you reflect 60 years later on where you think we are now and what you would like to see um, still moving forward? And that question's for either one of you. Mama? 60 years, uh, in 60 years, uh, it really hurts me to see that some things have gone backwards and uh, racism is still here. And uh, We uh, seem like we've been, haven't been treated like we're equal, but <laughs> we will overcome. 
Thank you, Nadine. Appreciate it. Okay, so the next question is from Kim. As we see, most cities are still highly segregated. Is this true for Roanoke today? It's me, I think. Yeah, yeah, either one. It's fine. I think this one. Um, um, the last time I visited Roanoke, like a lot of things were were better, of course. Um, but um, as far as like class or location wise, um, it's still kind of integrated when it comes to the neighborhoods, what side of the neighborhoods you on, you go to different areas. I noticed that, um, I always noticed that um, by downtown Roanoke, uh, they have they have everything fixed up. Everything is new. You know, they upgraded, they upgraded the, the city, but it's not upgraded in the poor black neighborhoods. And that, that that's the issue. You know? And yeah, so it, that needs to change. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions on how they could change that? I mean, it's a big question. It's a big question to ask, but like, what comes, what comes to the top of your mind? Like if you, if you had, if you had the decision, you had the directive to change something tomorrow, what would you want to do? I would probably do, uh, I would probably start with, um, like starting a budget, um, economic, you know, economic, uh, make economic changes. Um, we need um, more, just pour more, uh, pour more, more money into the communities that need it the most. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just as much as the money that is being spent in downtown Ronald, in, in, in downtown area, you mm -hmm. need to do the same thing in the um, poor, poorest communities. And I would, I would, I would, um, I know it probably takes uh, the local government to, to do that, you know, um, within, um, but I would like start a budget just for, just for that, just for that purpose, you know, to fund the, the poor neighborhoods. And of course the poor neighbor, the poorest neighborhoods of the poor are, are well in Ronald anyway, are of course in the, um, cities that, that, you know, uh, are mostly minorities that live there. That's what I would do. Yeah. I'm going to follow that question real fast. Um, somebody, somebody put a question, great question from Sharifa. Uh, mm -hmm. Nate, if your grandfather was alive, what things would he be working on today? Oh, wow. Yeah. A good question. That's a 2022, good question. man. <laughs> That's question. a lot to work on, right? Um, <laughs> Where do you start? Unfortunately, um, I think if my grandfather was alive today, if he was still here, you know, um, of course, he would be he would not be happy <laughs> because we're kind of going backwards on certain certain issues that he fought so hard to uh, dismantle. Uh, so, um, of course, um, I see somebody say reparations. <laughs> of course, that would be now, now reparations. That would help out a lot, um, especially for those um, in those communities, you know, um, in the poorest communities. But um, I'll, I'll say the biggest thing he would he would he would um, fight for is um, these voting rights laws, these anti-voting rights laws in the South. Um, you know, being pushed today um, by the you know most mostly Republicans in the South um, to create it harder for minorities to, to, to vote, um, actually for anybody to vote. You know, down you know down there. I mean, they. It's just a mess. It's a shame. Um, yeah, it's going, you're going backwards. So he, he'll probably take that that fight up mm. in the court. You know, right? Yes. yes, feel that man. Feel that. Hey, Nadine. So I mean, you touched on it. You touched on it in your presentation a bit, but um, you know, going back, how was it on your first day of school on September seventh, nineteen sixty? How were you treated by the students and teachers? Do you have any particular memories that you want to share with us? 
Go ahead, tell it, Mama. Tell it. That's what I he asked me when I already <laughs> spoke about. He pushed tell it in. So um, <laughs> okay, uh, I left out y'all that uh the class in my classroom, uh, one of the students he asked me was I a nigger, and I just said something out the blue. I said, "Are you a figure?" If I'm a nigga, you're a figure. But uh, it didn't bother me that much because I, did, I wasn't aware of, of name calling that much at that age, seven years old. But I went home to tell my father and mother about it. And uh, I realized that that wasn't a good thing there. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. For Maxine, we have Reverend R. R. Wilkinson was a hero. Uh, this is uh, is this appreciated in Roanoke? Is there a museum or monument in his honor? Hmm. You, you just don't, don't get us started. <laughs> don't get us started on We're that. Working on that. <laughs> Mama, you want to you want to go first or should I? No, you go ahead. Um. That was like one of the reasons why um, we started, we created the um, rrwilkinson.org website um, to, to let the people know, especially the young people know about um, the achievements, see the civil rights achievements that happened in Ronald to let them know their history. And um, unfortunately the school curriculum in Ronald do not have any classes about my grandfather. Mm. Now they have mm, mm. they have classes or they, they acknowledge certain black figures in Ronald that lived in that's from from Ronald. Um but you know and they have a street name after the first black mayor of Ronald. Um and of course um my grandfather paved the way for for him to be the first black mayor of Ronald, um, he was black, he was mayor for a lot of years um, until he passed away. But um, so they have, the, the, I think that's the that's the only um, that's the only acknowledgement they have of of, of um, so yeah, no, they, that's the only you know acknowledgement they have of um, you know uh, by grandfather. And that is the only, the only, yeah, the only one, the only, um, the only thing that I have on my grandfather that that is acknowledged or celebrated is the uh, the, the, the NAACP uh, Ronald Memorial Award for Social Justice. They named that award mm -hmm. in the uh, name of my grandfather. But that's it. And um, I guess like you can say, my his church library. He had the church library in Hill Street Baptist Church. Um, but those, but that's it, really. Um, nothing else, sadly. So we just okay. trying to change, trying to change that. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Hey, Nadine, here's a question for you. Did you make any friends in your classroom, or have you had any, or did you have any good memories from school integration? And that's from Angel. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I made friends there. Um, Tell you the truth, the, the one that asked me, the little boy that asked me, was I a nigger? Uh, he ended up being in my third grade class and we became friends. And, 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 and come to think of it, we were the two class clowns. Right. But, uh, and the other question was what? Oh, did you have any good memories from school integration? Yeah, I did. And uh, I, like I said, I, I made friends. And then um, moving on to Portsmouth, Virginia in 1969, when I had to go to a white high school, uh, it, it, it was better uh, opportunities there. And it was okay. Okay. You're a class clown? Yes, I was. <laughs> yeah? 
My what father, did you, what did you do? Had a you got to give us an example. You brought it up. You got to give us an example of what you did. Oh, what was the I, typical Nadine, really? Nadine Wilkinson Johnson <laughs> prank? Do I really? <laughs> well, what happened was, like, I always got picked on as well. And um, mm -hmm. the little white boy uh, tried to pull the chair out so I could fall mm -hmm. on the floor. Mm -hmm. Right. So I got the opportunity to do the same thing to him. So I, and he yeah. failed. So the teacher mm -hmm. caught me, caught me. <laughs> so she would tell me to go stand in the corner. But uh, the two of us, the white little boy and the white, and, and me, we end up uh, getting in trouble all the time. That's adorable. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Love it. Okay, so here's another question. Uh, how much do you think school segregation has been a success, particularly as it relates to today? Um, and then this this component of the question is from Daphne. Where do you where do we still need to go? I think we need to uh, learn to accept ourselves and learn to love ourselves and and just work harder on. Uh, like, just don't accept that this is the way it is. We need to just, like we're doing now, the Black Lives Matter, we need to just keep pushing. Hmm. Don't, don't just accept what they offering us and how they treating us. Hmm. Hey, Nate. Yes. Got a quick question for you about your website. Um, how can we let people know how to, to uh, donate on your website? What's the, what's the best way of doing that? Do you have a, is there a, a particular button or is there a page on your website for that? Or should they contact you directly for donations? They probably could contact uh, me or uh, my aunt. Um, her number is on there, Danita Wilkinson. She's on there too. Okay. Um, so would they, when they, when they go on the website, would they go to the contact section? Yes, yes, contact. Okay, okay. Okay. So everybody, everybody in the chat, if you want, if you want to check out the website, it's rrwilkinson.org and go to contact. And in contact, you'll see their their uh their email information. You can also call them directly, right? Do you have do you have phone numbers in there? Okay, cool, cool. Yes, okay, oh, perfect. Yes. Okay, so here's another question for you, Nate. Um and it and it relates to that. Um I gotta find it though. <laughs> <laughs> Where is it? Uh -oh. Get all of these questions out of here. Um, okay, so actually, I'm going to ask you this question. Um, how has your father's legacy impacted your life personally, Nate? My grandfather's? Um, personally, the freedom of uh, the things that he fought for, my grandfather fought for um, during, the, during the 60s. The freedom of choice, the freedom of choice, the freedom of choice into where I can go. And I admit today, I take it. I mean, well, most, I guess most people in my, especially my generation, um, we, are, we kind of take this for granted. We can go anywhere um, without being harassed. Uh, most of us, um, I know uh, we can, Eat at any restaurant without seeing signs that says colored, all whites only. Mm -hmm. um, there's no signs today that has that. We can go to the movie theaters. We can sit up front, not in the back. We, we can sit in the back if we want to, you know, we can sit anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. There's no, there's no colored, um, there's no colored um, sections. On a balcony, nothing like that. There's no um, restrictions on the buses anymore. You know, I can go, I can go on the bus. And I take the bus regularly. I can go in there and sit up in the front, or I can sit in the middle, or I can sit in the back. Mm -hmm. And so, those are the things that we take for granted. I think um, are like are the, the legacy for people like my grandfather. Who, you know, who sacrificed themselves uh, so that. Future, future generations can have it way better than um, than they did. Awesome, thank you so much. 
Um, I'm going to do one little shout out. Cassandra's joined us. Cassandra is Nadine's sister. And she says, hey, I'm so proud of my family. And thank you, Garrett County, for this opportunity to tell, you, tell our civil rights story. So thank you, Cassandra. We appreciate you uh, joining us tonight. Um, right now, we're going to go into a request that Nadine had. Um, Nadine, if you want to take it over with uh, We Shall Overcome, lead us in, in song. You ready for that? Yes. Thank you all for having me. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I would like for everyone to sing together, We Shall Overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. Someday. Oh, deep in my heart. I do believe we shall overcome someday. Black and white together. Black and white together. Black and white together, right now. Oh, deep in my heart, we do believe we shall overcome right now. God is on our side. God is on our side. God is on our side. Today. Oh, deep in our heart. We do believe God is on our side today. Amen. <laughs> that was beautiful. Good night, everybody. <laughs> and uh, for the for the picture, uh, the picture you you all seen, the cover of uh, my my mother. Um, that was my Aunt Cassandra holding the books right beside her, walking to school in 1960. Uh, that was her. Wow. 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 Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. We're so honored to spend the last, last night of Black History Month with you all. This is beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Um, I just wanted to share a quote that inspired our celebration this year. This is our first annual Black History Month program. And you know, this, this quote really touched me from um, the writer Dante Stewart. And he said, Black History Month is not simply asking, how can I remember and learn about Black people? It is all of us asking, how can we love Black people by seeing them, hearing them, and creating a world where Black people feel loved, inspired, and protected? Black history is not one day. It's not one month. Black history is every day, year round. Let's all continue to learn and celebrate it. And now for closing remarks from the president of the Garrett County NAACP branch, Dr. Daphne Gooding. I, that was really inspiring. And because actually I'm a little bit older than your mom, Nate, this okay. is all not ancient history to me. This is for real history. And I hope I can say as a person of faith, we have to draw closer to God and we will be pulled closer together. Um, and I look forward to the days that we are much closer together. 
Thank you so much. Amen. And thank everyone for attending tonight. These are real people. Yep. Ordinary people who have done extraordinary things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Don't for say good night, too. Not everybody. Hey, good night, Judy. Good night to all. Thank you for coming good out. Good night. Danita's, good night. Danita's been shouting, shouting y'all out too. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cassandra, for joining yeah. us. Really appreciate it. There you go. Bye, Val. Bye, Don. Bye, Sharifa. Bye, Laura. Bye, Laura. Thank you. 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 Thank you.